I want to start a home improvement business in Google Air 2, said Tando Feglin, and I can do it for only a thousand rand. I had no idea whether he could do it, but Tando became one of the winners in the first thousand rand challenge in 2000, about 17 years ago. Hi, I'm Gavin, and these are the Coffee Conspiracies. A few months before I met with Tando, I was a judge in a business plan competition. The prize was, for South Africa, quite substantial, a million rand, about $150,000 back then. For some reason, at the final award ceremony, the organizers invited a chap who had reached the previous year's finals, but not won anything, to give the keynote address. The man was very unhappy. In the midst of quite a heartfelt rant in which he was close to tears, he declared, unless you're a millionaire, you can't start a business. I did a quick calculation. 10 million people in South Africa, about 30% of the adult population, are unemployed. At 15 people per business, that would require 700,000 new businesses and a total investment of $100 billion, equivalent to almost a third of GDP. It's an absurd number, and the brutal reality is that most of us wanting to start a new business will never have access to a million of any currency unless there are Zimbabwe dollars, where as you can see, I'm a trillionaire. <clears throat> I thought hard about this and wanted to see if I could upend that belief. So I got my consultants together and we put out a challenge. We would fund five businesses for a thousand rand each, about a hundred dollars. These wouldn't be toy businesses, but real ones meant to support people. I wanted to see if it was possible, which is how Tando ended up in my office. It was, and over the next few years I had tremendous success with the model. The original training materials are still online and I've linked them in the description below. Let me summarize what I learned. Your first step is to create a minimum viable business, one which has the single objective of supporting you. If you have independent means or a very supportive spouse, perhaps you can get by with less. Next, when you do your sums and decide how much money you think you need to invest, divide that number by 10, then divide it by 10 again. Between those two new calculated numbers is the amount you should actually spend. If you think you need a million pounds, what you actually need is somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000 pounds. If you're careful and creative, you may even get it to almost nothing. Because let me make this abundantly clear, you are highly unlikely to get either a loan or venture capital, and for most people, raising 100,000 pounds is impossible. Before you swear and change channels, let me explain. There are three types of entrepreneurs spread out along a continuum. At the one extreme are people like those I worked with living in informal settlements around Cape Town. Houses made from corrugated iron sheets only a little more robustly put together than the way a child makes houses with playing cards. People surviving. People like the young woman I told you about in the episode where I discussed whether your business will ever work. People who would take a job if one were on offer, but in South Africa there was and is over 30% unemployment. If you're poor and uneducated, your chances of ever finding work are low. Perhaps you're in such a situation. Maybe your entire industry has been made redundant and you're just a little too old for retraining, but a little too young for retirement. Maybe you recently completed a prison term and are trying hard to build a new life for yourself. Maybe you've just been terribly unlucky. At the other extreme are those striving to be the next celebrity billionaire business magnate. Whether they think of themselves as the next Google, Uber or Exxon is immaterial. Their chances of success are mostly beyond their own control, and there is little guidance one could give or that they would even listen to. For the rest, the vast majority of business owners and entrepreneurs, we're in this because we have a particular itch we wish to scratch. You like solving problems, or you always wanted to be a brewer, or you love fixing cars, or working with your hands, or with your head, or leaving the store to staff and going surfing every Friday afternoon, and you love the freedom of running your own company. There are any number of reasons, but most of you are happy to make enough money to have an enjoyable life and spend time with friends and family. Sometimes your business worries you, but mostly things are okay. And when things are worrying, well, then you turn to the internet to see if the person on YouTube has any ideas. Whatever your situation, very few people have access to the sort of instant cash required to throw £100,000 into a new venture, money you could lose entirely. In a previous episode, I asked you to consider whether the business you're interested in can work at all, not whether your business in particular will work. I've not answered that last question, but I know that most people who want to start a business have one question first. How much money can I raise? So I want to address that. The most important thing to do is to get started.
If you decide that a specific monetary target is the only way, you'll probably never get going. Raising money, or trying to, will become your business. So I'll say it again. Recalibrate what you think you need to 1-10% to of what you thought you needed. This does impose serious constraints on you. Maybe you wanted to run a full-size restaurant. What would it look like if it was just a cart? Maybe you wanted to make custom engineering components and needed a very expensive lathe. Could you rent time on someone else's machine when they're not using it? Could you borrow? Could you make something that requires similar skills but is much cheaper and easier to start with? Could you do it from a market stall? Could you do it from your bedroom? Could you make it smaller? Your intention is more important than your size. Any successful business can grow, but a struggling business will sap your soul and destroy your relationships with the people you need most. Starting as small as possible will allow you to be more flexible. Changing your products or availability or geographic range is easy when you're not dragging along a huge investment stuck in fixed capital, because a property you just sunk a million pounds into is not very easy to change, but a cart or using the bus? Easy to move. That's not to say that raising even a thousand pounds is easy, but you have more options. Maybe you can get 30 days from a supplier by impressing them with your professionalism and determination. Maybe your client will supply the materials and tools if you supply your time. That way you have no cost but your time. Maybe a friend is willing to let you work out of her factory for a few months until you're up and running. Explore the relationships you have, but ask for little and be clear about what your exit is. How long will you be using their support? How will you know it is time to stop entirely or can afford to move one step up? And do it in steps. Don't jump from a thousand pounds to a million pounds. Go to ten thousand pounds first. Spend only on the most important things. The same is also true for an existing business which has fallen on hard times. If you've established that there is still a market for what you're selling, but your overheads have gotten ahead of your capacity to deliver, how easily can you scale down? Sure. It's horrible laying people off, or leaving a commercial property that may have been in your family for generations. But if the business fails entirely, a great many more people will be left worse off. Someone needs to make the hard decisions, and if it's your business, that's you. Getting back to Tando's home improvement business. Construction is an expensive business to get into. Not only do you need a vehicle to transport all the bricks and wood and other materials, but you also need to purchase those materials in advance. Tando had the building and technical skills, but he did not own any of the basic tools required to fix gutters, repair roofs, or put up new walls. He purchased these tools with 600 rand, and then went to people in his neighborhood offering to do minor repairs. They purchased all the materials for him, and he did the work. This helped Tando in two different ways. Firstly, he didn't have to buy or transport any materials himself, saving that expense. Secondly, his clients knew exactly what they were buying and didn't have to worry about a contractor watering down the cement or paint to cut costs. All Tando did was to take the materials and act as the technical labor on any project. Within four months of starting his home improvement business, Tando was turning 5,000 rand per month. In South Africa, that constitutes the lower end of middle class. Tando's business was very simple. But simple does not mean easy. Not everyone knows how to build or repair roofs or that sort of thing. But it is simple because he didn't have to explain to his clients what he was going to do. If the roof is leaking, his clients understand it needs fixing, even if they can't do it themselves. Tando may have wanted the latest sanders, drills and electric saws. They were too expensive. What he could get cheaply second hand, he did. The rest he had to do without. I've got many examples like Tando. But let's work through a coffee cart. A cart, whether in a small vehicle or attached to a bicycle will cost you a few thousand pounds to set up. After that, since you'll run it yourself, you'll have one salary plus your street trading license to pay for. Let's start with a salary of 2,500 pounds and an annual street trading license is about 600 pounds. Yes, most towns offer street licenses for a very small fee. As a rough and ready guide, at this scale, your total wage class plus total rent will be about 40% of break even. So with these costs, you'd be looking at about £6,400 a month to break even. If you sell coffee for £2.50 and sandwiches or snacks for another £2.50, you need to sell about 60 coffee and sandwich combos a day to cover your costs. This is your minimum viable business, the least you need to do, and the lowest cost you will incur to create an income for yourself. If it goes wrong and you need to back out and go find a job, you lose the cost of the cart and your street trading license. That could be a lot for you, but it's survivable. 
60 per day may work in some places and may not work in others. A mobile cart gives you the ability to find out, and there's the option of doing interesting combinations. There is a chap in London who has a minuscule stall that serves coffee and takes in clothing for dry cleaning. You could also offer to partner with an existing business. Setting up a tiny coffee stand with a few chairs squeezed into the corner of an existing clothing, bicycle or bookstore can help them drive more business while offering you a relatively cheap location out of the rain. You can scale that up to a more formal store. Your, cont your rent and staff costs will rise dramatically. Your break-even goes up substantially, as does your capital cost to set up the business. Go too big and you'll need to be, uh, borrow a great deal of money. Debt is money that you buy. £100 bought for £120. A business that could make money without debt might fail because of your finance charges, and then you may be left with debts that exceed any future wages you may earn. What we're doing is working towards imagining the worst. Look it in the face, and then move on. We'll get to that in a future episode. Until then, let's go support a business and get some coffee.